heard about Carlina, but she's, yeah, but she, she, her rotator cuff now has to be, and it, it's an old injury, which the doctor found on the MRI, and she won't be back till fall next year, so she's not doing, I'll, I'll be end up ending up with Barbara to go get the giant stuff, but not, I can't do Wednesday. That way she she will get the surgery when they're not going to school. And she that's why it's so
We're glad those of you who are at home joining us as well um, or joining us later on during the week. Uh, like or comment so we know that you're here and that we can welcome you. Our worship theme and our readers invite us uh, to be present this season. Uh, you'll see the names that are in the bulletin for our readers today. We thank you so much. Um, and we thank Jeff Brace for being our soloist this morning. So let's worship God with our whole heart, mind, body, and soul um, as we come together. In our Advent series, we are celebrating the gift of being truly present to each other and to the call of God to make this world a better place. We can be the gift of presence with those who are experiencing life as a less than peaceful, but this might also be true of how we are personally feeling in this moment. Our lives can feel a bit chaotic or in need of a makeover. The good news is that God is continually making a way for do-overs. In this, we can find peace, even when life doesn't feel so peaceful. This week, we focus on what it means to be a gift of non-anxious presence for those who need it most. What can... unwrap a present on the second Sunday of Advent with great anticipation for the gift that God will reveal. We open our hearts as we open the gift. The promise of peace is a divine gift we receive, and what will we do with it? The gift of Christ's peace reminds us that we can be, we can have serenity even in the most, in the midst of non-peaceful situations. Peace is not simply the absence of conflict. Peace is an ever-present gift that we can open at any time when we stop, breathe, and trust that we are never alone. And the gift of peace we can give is to be present for those who feel alone. We light this candle of peace as a sign that we will be in, in peace in the world. living light of God, you are our peaceful presence. Let this peace grow in our lives each day so we can be a present of peace to others. Unwrap and open our hearts. May it be so. Amen. I invite all who are able to rise in body or spirit to greet one, of those, greet one another around you and be a presence and present to each other. <laughs> If you want to go over there, you can. <laughs> well, now you can because everybody's moving around. You're good.
I would like to invite all of our younger friends to come over here and gather slightly close to the tree. Over where Miss Tiffany is. Over here. <laughs> this Welcome, friends. It is the second Sunday of the season of Advent. For all of you who were not with us last week, we discovered all these presents here in church. Wow, it is like being under the Christmas tree already. Last week, we learned that we can give the gift of hope to others. The gift of hope visited us and gave us all kinds of ideas about how easy it is to give hope. This week, we are going to talk about the gift of peas. Do you like peas? No. <laughs> What? You think peas is a weird gift? Yeah. That's what it says here, the gift of peas. Oh, that makes sense. Last week, Hope wanted everyone to get chocolate cake, and it just kind of got stuck on food, I guess. The gift of peace is a wonderful thing. That's much better than peas. Well, I did like green. Do you like my bow? Peace has a green bow to represent the growing we are all able to do when we live in peace with each other. We nurture one another uh, with peace, and then we get to be able to be strong and tall and confident. I'm thinking that you could be my gifts of peace in training to help me spread peace to others. Not peas. Yes, that would be wonderful. I like to spread peace, but sometimes I worry. I'm not sure I have any peace inside to give. Ah, that's very common. But you know what? You don't have to wait until everything is peaceful around you to actually find a little peace inside you. You can breathe a breath of prayer. I'll show you. Want to try it with me? Take a deep breath in, and then we are going to let the breath out with a sigh out loud, very slowly. Wow, that's cool. I feel calmer and more peaceful already. I think I could do that when I need more peace. We have green bows, bows in the manger this week, and some things you could say to be a gift of peace to others. It says, give peace a chance, let's let everyone live in peace. Those are great suggestions. Before you get your bows out of the manger, let's pray a repeat after me prayer. Ready? Dear God, Dear God, we thank you for the gift of peace. We thank you for the gift of peace. Help us be the gift of peace. Help us be the gift of peace. For anyone that needs it. For anyone that needs it. Amen. Thank you so much. It sure is good to know that I have some help spreading peace all around. Don't forget to pray your, uh, your breath prayer of peace this week. Be sure to have a green bow. All right, you want to grab your bow? Right. So you're all going to grab a green bow, and then you get to come with me. And don't worry, I will return them. The Gospel reading is from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. It is the very beginning of the book setting up the idea that this story of Jesus will be a transformative experience. Drawing on the prophet Isaiah, Mark tells his readers that God is making a way in the most difficult places, 
clearing open paths in the desert places, John the Baptist shows us in Advent, as he typically does a sign, that the time has come when the Messiah, born of the Spirit, will be present among us. Here begins the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it was written in Isaiah the prophet. I sent my messenger before you to prepare you a way. A herald's voice in the desert crying made ready the way of our God. Clear a straight path. And so John the baptizer appeared in the desert, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to John and were baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. John was clothed in camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, and he ate nothing but grasshoppers and wild honey. In the course of his preaching, John said, One more powerful than I is to come after me. I am not fit to stoop and untie his sandal straps. I have baptized you in water, but the one to come will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. This is the end of today's reading. May God's word point us to the presence of peace in our lives, church, and world. And may we be present with peace to those who need it most. What's your favorite place that's peaceful? Take a minute and just think about all of that. Where do you know peace? Where's your favorite place or time? Sometimes peace is when things are quiet and still. And sometimes peace might be when things are noisy and chaotic, but our hearts are still full or things still feel, still feel right or just. Peace might even be busy, but underneath it all, at the core of it, you feel like you're in the right place and time, or maybe even that God's a part of what you're going through. So when do you feel at peace, even though things might be swirling around in your life or in the world. You may have heard me talk about how meditation has been a big part of my life, um, especially the last four years or so. I've always practiced a variety of prayer practices and meditations through the years, uh, but it wasn't until I was diagnosed with atrial fibrillation a couple years ago that I really got more serious about it and more regular about my, my meditation practices. I was fortunate that I had a cardiologist who said, um, you know, you really need to be doing meditation to help with stress and to help with your heart rate. And so I did the, he recommended the mindfulness-based stress reduction, which Lehigh Valley Hospital offers. Um, and then he also recommended that I do Qigong, which is like Tai Chi, which is basically moving meditation. And I will say that these two practices have really changed my life, um, even saved my life, and they have really deepened my faith, and they've increased my sense of peace. I've been leading a few meditation and prayer groups over the last few years, 
uh, Zoom one for our church members and the community and a Zoom one for the Penn Artis Conference. And when I talk with those groups about meditation, I often use the language about um, vacation, that meditation is often like going on a vacation. So think about uh, your favorite places for vacation or when you feel like you're getting a vacation. What does that feel like? Um, what, what does it make, what, does, what, what do you need to make it feel like a vacation? Or deep, rock, deep relaxation, for some of us, we love going to the movies or a show or a concert, um, or we love to go for a walk or be outside, or maybe even a really good deep uh, nap or sleep uh, gives us a, a better sense of peace and rest. I, um, when I'm on vacation, I love being near the mountains. Uh, but even around here, we're so fortunate that we're near the mountains and the hills of the Appalachians. So almost anywhere you drive, you're kind of going to find or be surrounded by mountains. Research shows us that brains need a break. Our bodies need a break. Uh, science tells us that we can't be in fight or flight mode forever. Uh, we can't be in survival mode all the time or something you know, changes, or it affects our health or our well-being in one way or another eventually. And God, our faith, reminds us that we can't be stressed all the time. Uh, God talks about Sabbath and that time of rest. Uh, it doesn't say it has to be on a Sunday, but it has to be some time that we rest and we find time with God. Meditation for me, and I think for many people, is like uh, going on a vacation, especially when we can't get on a vacation, especially when we can't really make life stop um, as much as we want to or even at all, you know, in the moment or the season we're in. So that's some of the language I use to talk about mindfulness and meditation is this sort of vacation uh, without a vacation kind of way of thinking. The worship series that we're using for Advent also talks about mindfulness on the screen and in your program is a book that we're reading. Our Friday and Sunday group is reading it. Um, and I had 50 copies on the table last week and they're all gone. So probably somewhere in our church there are about 70 people who are, re who are reading this book. And if you haven't picked it up, it's out there on Amazon. You can Kindle it, you can uh, get a hard copy, a paper copy, but it's a really great introduction to mindfulness. And it has the chapter, one, the one chapter we read this week has a bunch of practices, simply, ex super simply explained. Um, and there's also, a, I'm posting videos that we're using in the class, uh, 10 minute videos where you get to hear and meet the author, as well as sit through a mindfulness or a meditation practice. And she's really good at also weaving Christian uh, language and practices into that. So those, are, those posts, uh, those videos are going out on a post on Sunday or Monday or an email if you're on our email list, if you want to catch those videos. One of the writers of the series says that he likes to use a synonym for peace, uh, the word equanimity. Equanimity is a word that describes peace as a posture. Uh, equanimity allows us uh, to meet disruptions, pain, unexpected challenges, all with a mindful and accepting peace. When we're trying to find peace, there's a lot we can do for our environment to aid that. And the author says, I completely have redesigned the layout of my workspace recently and was surprised at how making my environment more orderly and pleasing to look at um, really had an effect on my equanimity, on my peace. It makes sense to talk about it, but it's another thing to experience it. So we can do a lot to invite God's peace into ourselves, our minds, our lives. We can reorder our environments. We can choose a posture of equanimity. Uh, we can reconcile with those that we've hurt or who have hurt us. There are lots of options and possibilities. The peace of God gives us a deep well of strength with which we can face our mortality and the hardships that we encounter in life. The words of comfort of Isaiah in scripture are words to encourage God's people to be at peace. For even the might of God comes to us as gentle as a shepherd who carries lambs. And in the Gospel of Mark, our reading today, uh, there's no version of the birth story in Mark like there is in Luke and Matthew. Instead, Mark starts with the story of John the Baptist that we hear. 
Um, and probably because John the Baptist was very popular and beloved, uh, he was sharing God's word and the word of Christ. Um, and Mark doesn't set him up to be a competitor with Jesus, but more of a precursor, uh, kind of setting, making the path clear and straight for Jesus to come and for people to come to know Jesus. Mark prepares us to receive this Jesus who is sort of outside of the box, not the Messiah or the King maybe that people were expecting, but someone with deep love and commitment to them. The writer of this series says that when I read this passage in the broader context of this being the week of peace, I find myself thinking of just how frequently we desire peace, but we can so often get it wrong in how we get there. We hope for peace, we wait for peace, we make paths straight for peace. Our call to worship says this, preparing the way for new beginnings, fresh starts, a clear path is a classic theme in the faith narrative and in our own lives. Life can contain many chapters. The good news is that the Holy One is continually making a way for do-overs. I love that. God is continually making a way for do-overs. And in this, we can find peace even when life doesn't feel so peaceful. This week, we focus on what it means to be a gift of non-anxious presence for those who need it most. So how can we not only find peace, but hold on to it, especially in the midst of war and violence and as life swirls around us and within us? How can we know equanimity and peace regardless of what else is happening? I'm wondering if you know people who model this for you. Are there people who are really good at staying grounded or peaceful um, regardless of what's going on in their lives? Um, maybe you've heard the saying that watch what you do and say because the pastor might use you in a sermon. If you haven't heard that, I'm just telling you that now. Um, this week I'm going to talk about our Family Promise volunteers. I didn't get their permission, just warning you. Uh, last week I got to see this non-anxious, peaceful presence and leadership among our volunteers. I got to see equanimity in action. During our Family Promise Weeks, uh, four times a year, about four times a year, our church hosts three to four families that are homeless. And sometimes they are newly homeless, and this is a new thing for, this, for them, and sometimes they're chronically homeless. They've been homeless before, it's happened to them a couple of times. And even under the care of this program, which does everything it possibly can to help them uh, get back on their feet and to live their lives, it's still a really stressful and hard time for these families um, who have to move every week to a new church or faith community. Um, they stay a week here in our space, and then on Sunday they move to the next place they're gonna be for the next week. Uh, the families that we meet uh, are often in between jobs. Some of them have lost everything, um, and many of them are literally starting their lives all over from scratch. So our 40 or so volunteers from our church graciously welcome these families into our building, creating a warm and safe space for them to sleep, serving them meals, uh, meeting together with them during meals, listening to their stories when they're able to and willing to share, um, and creating um, a peace, as much of a peaceful environment as we can. There's a lot of work to be done before the families arrive too. Uh, food shopping, finding the volunteers, setting up the bedding, creating a space, um, the rooms, the kind of bedrooms for us, which, is, which are our Sunday school rooms, uh, working with Family Promise to arrange schedules and special needs, and, and then hosting them every night and every morning. Our 40 volunteers do an incredible job uh, being a place of peace and welcome, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's hard, even when they see things and hear things uh, that are really difficult to hear. It's when we get to hear the real stories of what families are going through, um, how they're you know, not quite themselves, what the issues that they're dealing with. And so I, what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna pick on a little bit more of our volunteers. First of all, to thank all 40 of them and also our steering team, which does a bulk of 
the work as well. But I'm going to pick a little bit more on our key leaders, Carrie and Rose Snyder, who were at 8 o'clock. So I picked on them and Ralph and Connie Gioelli, who are here right now. So um, I'm, I'm not, I didn't get their permission either, right? So I'm, I'm probably going to be in trouble. But, but I want to talk about the four of them because um, what I see in their leadership is this non-anxious presence um, creating this huge welcome and embrace. And they're the face of Family Promise for us. They interact with the Family Promise staff, the Family Promise families, and all of our volunteers, all of us. Um, they have this gift of making everyone feel at ease um, as we move into. They're great at communicating and uh, encouraging people and supporting all of us through the week and, and the families through the week. Um, especially when things are hard or challenging or maybe, you know, not quite what we had hoped. Um, and so I want to thank, thank them especially and thank all of our volunteers and thank our church. You know, we said yes to this a bunch of years ago and it's a huge undertaking. It really is. It's not just it, it opening up our doors, but it's learning about what it's like to be homeless and learning about the different things that people are going through, the different services that they need um, and how Family Prompts provides them as well as all the little details that all of you take care of so well and so um, lovingly. So if you haven't become a part of this important life-changing ministry, um, I, encourage you, I encourage you to do so. So that's you know, one example of where I see this equanimity and this peace lived out in our leadership. Pastor Matt Smethurst is a pastor I, I read about this week, and he talks about peace this way. He says it's an idea, an immensely popular idea. We love talking about it. We love posting about it. We love dreaming about it and planning for it. But it sure can be elusive, isn't it? Uh, despite its universally beloved status, peace does not mark our word, our world. Um, and I don't simply mean unsettling headlines from distant lands. Peace eludes those in the securest of neighborhoods, the richest professions, the most advanced nations. Peace eludes even, uh, even us um, when we've arrived. He talks about a story about Michael Jordan, who in the 2009 NBA Hall of Fame uh, said this about the game of basketball. He said that basketball is his refuge. It's a place that he goes when he needs to find comfort and peace. And then a few years later, on the occasion of his 50th birthday in an ESPN interview, um, he was starting to kind of grieve that change in his life. And he said, how can I enjoy the next 20 years without so much of this game consuming me? How can I find peace away from the game of basketball? And Pastor Ginger Gaines Sorelli says, what she notices is that the account that we heard today about good news is that Jesus begins in the wilderness. Uh, this account of good news is all in the wilderness. He doesn't begin it in a party hall or a throne room. It doesn't begin in a time of peace and plenty. It doesn't even begin in what she calls a bucolic and potentially sapified setting with a manger and a glowing light. She says in Mark's version, the beginning of Jesus' story and ministry is in the wilderness. And the wilderness is where Israel rebelled against God time and time again. The wilderness is also where God continues to show up time and time again, bringing guidance, water from a rock, manna from heaven, elemental signs to lead the people. And the Jordan River, where John does his baptizing, runs through the wilderness, and it's symbolic of this time from one place, one life to the next. So that place where in this wilderness, the Middle East, uh, that is surrounded by violence and struggled and deep-seated enmity among people and nations. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ starts with a fragment, echoes a prophecy cried out by John, reverberating across the stark wilderness landscape of an occupied land filled with ancient, ancient enmities and alighting the waters of a murky river. And she ends with this, and she says, the good news begins right where it is needed the most, in a place of struggle and uncertainty. One of my favorite meditations in the MBSR tradition, you can Google uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction or John Kabat-Zinn and find 
a mountain meditation. Um, mountains have a lot to teach us. They're significant in many cultures. Uh, it, mountains are often sacred places where people receive uh, rest or uh, visions or dreams. And mountains rise above everything else. And in the meditation, we're invited to borrow the strengths and the qualities of a mountain, to think about how um, those qualities might help us discover how to move through life, how to uh, respond to what's going on in our lives and in the world with the strength and the stabi stability of a mountain. As we meditate on the mountains, we hope that it would empower us to encounter each moment with mindful composure and compassion. And this mountain meditation reminds us that we can go to the mountain anytime, whenever we need to stabilize and strengthen and steady ourselves. It also reminds us that in these mountains we can find rest and refuge. We can also uh, find God who is our rock and our refuge as well. So how can we know peace even when life around us is not stable, even when things are not rock solid? We heard in the opening of worship today, the gift of Christ's peace remind, uh, reminds us that we can have serenity even in the midst of non-peaceful situations. Peace is not simply the absence of conflict. It's an ever-present gift that we can open at any time when we stop and breathe and trust that we are never alone. And the gift of peace that we can give is to be present to those who feel alone. I love the verse from Philippians 4, 7 that says, And the peace of God, which transcends or passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So may God's peace transcend all that we know and experience. May it surpass whatever life throws us. May we know that God is with us in the midst of it all. And may we come to know that that same peace will and can guard our hearts and our minds in this uh, Christ child, with this Christ child who is born in us and in the world again and again. Amen. Let's go to a time of prayer. too often find ourselves multitasking or obsessing about something that isn't quite right or settled or the particular way we like it. We're very accustomed to a preoccupied mind that often has little peace. In this season, we will give ourselves a respite from this pace as we slow down in this prayer time, taking on a more peaceful rhythm. We'll begin our prayers with three questions, each followed by a short silence. Focusing intentionally on thoughts and memories can be a kind of prayer, bringing our, bringing our lives into a conversation with the holy. So if you're comfortable, I invite you to take a deep breath and close your eyes or look down. The first question is this. Who was a gift of presence to you this week? Did you experience their attention in a way that felt like a special connection? Take a moment to recall this in your mind's eye, seeing it emerge like an opening gift. If you can't recall such a moment, it's okay. This week, you will notice these moments more deeply. The second question is this. 
How did you offer yourself as a gift of presence? What did it feel like to extend your attentiveness and availability beyond yourself? Did you notice how it made a difference to someone else for you to be truly present to them? The third question is this. Is it possible that God's presence is felt more acutely in this moment when we truly tend to one another? What could you do this coming week that would allow God's gift of peace to flow through you to someone else? It may be as simple as finding opportunities to speak an encouraging word, or as complex as actually lifting up someone's circumstances through volunteering or donating. prayerful present moment we train our attention to pray for those who are in distress we pray for Barbara Diane Jamie Marlene Dorothy Susie Linda Maria a mother a mom a coach and dad a friend Joseph Jocelyn Beth and family a friend Deb Joyce Joe Ian Beverly Donna Jerry Michelle Elaine Tony Lucy Darlene and Dennis, Ronnie, Jack, Logan, Brad, Sharon, Audrey, a mom, a son, Jake, Josh, Dylan and Gabe, Aaron and Steph, the girls, patience with students, a parent, Landon, Elaine, peace on earth, mom and dad, a sister, for those with depression and anxiety and illness, Abby and the kids, Ryan and family, Catherine and family, Sheila, Matt, Sharon, safe travels, Suzanne and family, Ryan's family, those facing mental health challenges, a brother-in-law and family, a neighbor, prayers for family members who've lost their way, students, family friends, Rose, for the Ukraine, for Israel and Palestine. Hear our prayers, O oh God. In this prayerful present moment, we train our attention to also give thanksgiving and to celebrate joy. Someone is grateful for answered prayers. Another is grateful for peace and comfort they've received. Lots of babies being born. We pray for loved ones and families and friends, for Kenneth Israel, who we visited on Friday, for our children and youth, for our wise and gracious seniors. In this prayerful present moment, we ask you, Christ Jesus, the greatest gift of all, to help us savor our journey toward the celebration of Christmas. Help us recognize and create moments of sweet presence rather than filling the voids with things that do not last. Help us to stop to notice what we're experiencing, to accept it with open hearts and minds. And in doing this, we allow you to meet us in the right here, right now, right where we are. We pray in your holy and beloved name as we say together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. We forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
everyone is welcome and invited to join us for coffee hour in Memorial Hall after worship. And we invite anyone who might be baking over the next two weeks um, to please bring some cookies and share them with all of us for coffee hour. Your offering env envelopes for 2024 are available and also in Memorial Hall for you to pick up. Um, so please be sure to stop by and do that. Your bulletins are filled with plenty of opportunities to serve and learn here. There are several activities for our children, for our youth, and for adults, so please be sure to check out the cream-colored sheets in your bulletins. In the lobby, we have set up a little Christmas shop to say, sort of thing, um, where we have some really nice, uh, uh, yeah, mugs. I, the word just lost my head. Um, some mugs that are carry-out mugs. <laughs> I know. Words are hard this morning. <laughs> um, as well as canvas reusable bags, so please stop by and support the church um, and share your love and show your love around when you use them. We also have more uh, hoagie vouchers for Wawa. They're great uh, stocking stuffers, and they support um, Feed My Starving Children. So please be sure to stop and see Elliot set up out there um, for those. And tonight at 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary, we will be hosting the Parkland Chorale and their holiday concert. She made it. I made it, too. So if you took tags from the Angel Tree for the Salvation Army, um, they were due to, the presents were due today. So if you forgot them, could you bring them either later today, the building will be open all day, or tomorrow. Um, they'll be, they're getting delivered Tuesday. If that's a problem, you can contact Deb Wenner or call the office and let us know so we can work that out. Um, also, the Christ Christmas mission offering is listed in your uh, bulletin. It highlights the two focus ministries that we're supporting this season. One is the Sixth Street Shelter, which helps homeless families, um, and the other is the Central World Kitchen, which takes meals uh, when there are um, disasters and those kinds of things, which uh, chefs that go in into communities and cook food. Um, poinsettia sponsors, last day to, to sponsor poinsettias to decorate the sanctuary or to be delivered to those on our visitation list. Today's that deadline. Uh, we are looking for new consistory members to start in February. So if you're thinking about that and wondering about it or want more, more information, contact Eric Minnick, our consistory president, or myself. Uh, reminder that Donna Christman and the Church and Ministry Committee are uh, collecting Christmas gifts for the staff. The directions are in your bulletin. And then worship times for uh, extra worship coming up on the week of Christmas Eve, Friday night on Christmas Eve Eve Eve. Uh, we have a 7 p.m. service, and then on Christmas Eve itself, no morning services, but we have uh, Christmas Eve services at 3, 5, and 8. Because of you, our church changes lives. All the ways that you offer yourself here on behalf of God's ministry and mission, uh, whether it's your time, your talent, your treasures, uh, all of that makes a difference in the world, and we give God thanks for you.
Each week our benediction starts with a quote from the book that we're reading. As we strip away the cluttered surface of our lives and become more present in the moment, we may be disturbed by what we can now see in the open vista, especially the suffering of the least of these. We are no longer numb to the cries of those hurting. We ache for the violence humans do to one another and to the earth. We see all people and all creation held within God's love and life. Our comfortable lives are disrupted as we ask new and hard questions. But being more mindfully present will also bring greater awareness of God's presence, peace, and clarity in the midst of it all. So now go and be truly present so you may gift, be a gift of presence to others. That's all that is expected, that you would give that all that is you, um, the best gift you can give. And go now in the name of the Holy Presence, the divine gift, and the spirit of hope that is waiting for us to unwrap abundant life. Amen. We close our service with a Christmas carol. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow knew the chaos and sorrow of life sinking into a depression after his wife died and his son was badly injured in the Civil War. When Longfellow heard the bells on Christmas Day, he was encouraged that peace could come again one day to a troubled nation. And we carry that same hope for peace this day. <laughs> 